Welcome back, everyone. Uh, I'm going to hand you over to uh, Tom Galanis for this panel, who's director of Tag Media. Uh, we, uh, panel today will be looking at the IGAA, Affiliate Compliance and Responsible Gaming. Uh, over to you, Tom. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, am I on? Yes. Um, first of all, apologies for my voice. It's five days of conf conferencing for you. Um, I, quick introduction to what the IGAA is, because it's on, on there, obviously. Uh, it's the International Gaming Affiliate Association. Uh, I'm the initiator of it. It's a fairly nascent body uh, that's designed to assist and work with affiliates to um, help them become more compliant. Uh, obviously, it's a, a huge subject matter uh, at this moment in time, and obviously why we're sat here. Um, but also going to be addressing uh, on this panel and with the IGAA uh, affiliate responsibility, uh, which is, to my mind, and we can discuss this, uh, going above and beyond uh, and getting on the front foot when it comes to um, making sure that we're protecting the interests of vulnerable customers, which is uh, ultimately what the UK Game Commission uh, imply in the LCTP guidelines they set out. Um, there you go. Uh, obviously, to the point, if you've got any questions, download the Slido app. Um, I'll be asking the panelists some questions throughout. Um, alongside me here is Helen Southgate, who's the Managing Director EMEA of Acceleration Partners, which is a uh, digital marketing agency. Uh, Helen is also the chairman, chairwoman, chairperson, chairperson, woman, chairperson yeah. with that, uh, of the IAB's Performance Marketing Council. Um, she doesn't come from a, a gaming heritage, uh, but very much an affiliate um, network background. So looking more different industries. So we're going to get her, her insight into what uh, other verticals are doing uh, when it comes to affiliate compliance. Uh, Alex Tomic is the CEO, owner, operator of Alea, uh, a couple of casino brands. So we're going to get his insight of, as to what Alea are actually doing in the minute when it comes to affiliate compliance, but critically what they're looking for, for, for from their affiliates. Uh, and Ian Sims, who is a, a former affiliate, um, and runs Rightlander, which is an affiliate and operator compliance tool. Um, so I'm just going to jump into a, a question. Hmm. Alex, should operators be doing more to educate and involve affiliates in their own responsible gaming activity? Well, actually, we, and I don't know if it's very politically correct to say that, but we, we've not been given the choice now because we are, we are held responsible for the communication affiliates have about our brand. So yeah, we definitely do need to do it. Should that be our role? Uh, I'm not sure, to be honest. But uh, uh, let's say that uh, in the regulatory framework uh, that we have now, yes, definitely. We must do it. We, 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 we definitely must educate affiliates. Uh, 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 because it's, it's a part of this ecosystem. If uh, they don't uh, communicate as they should uh, about our brand, we will be held responsible. So we, we definitely have to do that. So the, the issue around that for me, I mean, obviously you have a UK license, I understand it. Yes. Um, the position that the Advertising Standards Agency take, the CMA take, uh, is, and obviously GDPR coming around the corner, um, is holding the affiliate, uh, the affiliate business that commits a, uh, a misdemeanor to account. They're the ones that get uh, get announced when, it, when there's a ruling. Um, the UK Gaming Commission's position currently is uh, looking at operators to be responsible uh, and holding their affiliates to account. Uh, Ian, obviously you, you as a uh, software provider uh, to both operator and affiliate, how, how do you see, uh, what feedback have you had from operators in terms of um, where, where they feel they need to get involved with affiliate compliance? I, I think there's a lot of confusion from the operator perspective on that at the moment, but, but it's very clear that um, I, sp I spoke to the Gambling Commission on Tuesday about it to, to understand a bit more about the tolerance levels. And um, it, the guy from the Gambling Commission was very clear that the Advertising Standards Authority are the ones that are driving it and they're kind of being responsive towards what's being driven their way from the ASA. Um, <clears throat> and the, the message was that when they know the industry needs to work together and the UK Gambling Commission need to work with the industry to prove things, uh, to make things better. But when they find instances of non-compliance and stuff that are issues, when they go to the operator, they're expecting to see that the operator is 
taking steps to do something about it, preemptive steps. So if they go to an operator with an issue and find that they're showing they, they haven't been doing anything to try and monitor their affiliates, then that for the Gambling Commission is a big issue. But if they're finding that operators have got procedures in place and they're actually actively trying to do something, then the inference was the tolerance levels are greater. So, you know, obviously, it's going to depend a lot on what the issue that was found was. But they're expecting the operator to be proactive in making sure their affiliates are compliant at the moment. And that's, that was very clear in the message. And they have no, they have absolutely no intention of taking the emphasis off, of, off operators onto affiliates. That was very clear as well. What do you mean about that? They don't have the, the intention to take the emphasis away? Sorry, what do you yeah. mean when, they, when you say they don't have the intention to take the emphasis they, away? They see very much that if an operator wants to run an affiliate program, then they take full responsibility for what their affiliates do. But why do you think it's, 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 it's that way? Why, why do you think that there is not like a license for being an affiliate uh, uh, under the UK uh, regime? Um, I, think, I think that's a natural next step. But I think Helen could probably offer a bit of insight here from looking at the finance industry and other industries and how they've reacted. Yeah, that's a good point. So Helen, yeah. um, looking from outside of gaming in, um, your role uh, with the IAB and Performance Marketing Council, uh, work, you work across uh, with related networks, affiliate networks, which obviously have wider prominence in, uh, in those verticals. Is the noise all right? Yeah? Okay. Sorry. I'm going to kick back in my ear. Um, how are other verticals such as finance uh, looking ahead at GDPR and compliance with their affiliates? What's the, what's the, what's the history there? Yeah, so I guess um, the history of so the Performance Marketing Council is run by the IAB. Um, and there's a group of people that within that council. So it's affiliate networks, uh, it's some of the major brands, some of the major affiliates, and some of the major agencies. And the objective is really to avoid imposed regulation. So it's all about how can we self-regulate and be ahead of the game so we avoid imposed regulation, which we really don't want. Now, I understand that's slightly different in the gaming market because you don't have as much choice there. But I think it's really interesting what's happening here at the moment because we've seen this happen in the finance industry. So finance affiliate programs now generally run with about 20 affiliates because the financial conduct authority is so strict on what they allow um, affiliates to do and again the emphasis is back on the advertiser and the brand to make sure their affiliates are doing the right thing that many of those advertisers got so worried about that they scaled all their affiliate programs back and Direct Line were on a panel at a conference I was at on Tuesday and they said they only work with 20 affiliates now. So from my point of view, that's terrifying because that's not what affiliate marketing is about. We really don't want to get in that position. Um, and I think it's important for the kind of gaming industry to think about how to avoid that. But then for the rest of the industry, so in retail and travel um, in telcos, there's less regulation. But now we're obviously very concerned about data protection laws and GDPR and how that's going to affect affiliates because affiliates are at the front, they're at the front of the kind of advertiser um, consumer journey. They are going to have to get consent to be able to drop cookies um, and to allow us to kind of track and and advertise to them. So our concern outside in the kind of bigger affiliate industry at the moment is our, our advertisers gonna do the same thing and start to scale back their programs because of that. And that's why we've got this collaboration, lots of networks, advertisers, brands to try and avoid that. Excellent stuff. So just to quickly jump in with the IGAA here. Uh, one thing we're certainly not looking to accomplish uh, is what we call effective self-regulation. Uh, we obviously have governance issued through, through operators uh, and the UK Gaming Commission to that regard. Uh, obviously, affiliates are expected to uh, comply with advertising standards law, um, direct marketing law, data protection law, which is obviously all of those things are evolving. Um, but just to jump back to your point, Helen, about the FCA and the finance and insurance industry, um, the FCA do and have authorised and um, made sure that sites like Go Compare, Money Supermarket, all obviously affiliates, huge affiliates of course, yep. uh, in, a, in a very different industry to the one we work in, um, but the FCA have got involved with affiliates directly. Uh, it's not something that we're in a position, uh, certainly in the UK market, 
uh, that the Gambling Commission quite clearly is not wanting to do that um, at this moment in time. In preface that. Um, guys, I mean, where do you think, you know, if we, if we came together uh, in a trade body like the IGAA, uh, could we replicate what, what uh, the body that Helen represents? Is there something that you think could be effective without formal licensing, formal authority? I mean, Ian, you mentioned it's a natural step. Do you think that's realistic? Um, well, realistic. I, th I think it's... There's, some, there's something happening in Denmark at the moment where they're actually... The, the Danish gambling authority are going down a similar kind of route to over here. And they are opening dialogues with affiliates. And they're prepared to sort of take action against individual affiliates and, and, and what have you. And so I think the UK is a hard one to gauge at the moment because I think everyone's running around a little bit confused about you know, what, what people need to do. And I think we'll know more about that landscape in six months' time. I think if you're talking about a body over here that can do that, I think the best thing at the moment is we need affiliates to engage in the compliance process because if they don't, the trust isn't going to be there between the affiliate and the operator. And an operator isn't going to work with an affiliate they can't trust. So I think the IGAA's role initially should be very much bringing the two sides together to understand their obligations and work together. But I think it has to have half an eye on the fact that there should be, if, if not some sort of accreditation process, something further down the line whereby people can align themselves with the body, whether it be something unofficial or official, that gives operators more confidence. And bringing the sides together is, is paramount. I think if you want to be an affiliate going forward, you have to engage with this and you have to show the operators you're engaged with this and you're doing everything you can. It's the only way you're going to survive in a regulated market going forward, in my opinion. Yeah, so we're talking about individual action here to comply. Uh, that much is clear. Um, there's obviously um, mixed understanding of what compliance actually means. Um, we, we talked about the laws, UK law. A lot of that UK law is relevant in EU, EU law as well, so advertising standards data protection in particular. Um, but gambling law is, is, is vague. Um, the requirements the UK Gambling Commission have put in place uh, on operators gets passed down to affiliates. Um, things like self-exclusion, um, which is a, a key thing. Alex, I don't know what your opinions on self-exclusion are and, and whether you allow your affiliates to market on email and SMS. Uh, that is a, it's not a legal requirement uh, for affiliates to not contact your self the customers. Obviously, you're going to get in trouble if they do. Um, how have you dealt with that, that particular issue? And, and this, uh, the, this new law coming up, now we're going to have a, a, a global self-exclusion system in the UK like they have in Denmark. So basically, when, uh, uh, when a player is self-excluded from one casino, he's going to be self-excluded everywhere. And that's another issue. But what we see is that the market is regulation is changing completely the way we we, we do business uh, in gambling. I think it's a it's a good thing. If you take responsible gaming, if you if you look at a source of fun, if you look at self exclusion, where where are we going towards? We're going to, towards uh, uh, gambling where you won't have. 10% uh, or 5% of your database base that make 95% of your business, like we used to have before, what we used to call the VIPs, or basically the, the big spenders. Or you could call them the addicts. We won't that, have that anymore in the future. We, we're going towards a gambling that's going to be more modern entertainment, where you will have a lot of more players spending 50 euros per, uh, per month. And actually, I think it's a good thing but it's a, it's a change of mindset for us. Instead of targeting a very small population of our players and, and uh, ripping them uh, off, we have to offer another kind of entertainment where players will feel safe, come, play uh, uh, casino games, uh, and, and, and don't spend uh, all, all their money. Uh, and if you think about that, <laughs> It's a global movement we have. Uh, you go back in the 50s or in the 60s, if you look at Mad Men, uh, uh, the guys that were coming at the office in the morning, having their whiskey, smoking cigarettes at the office, we didn't have uh, the security belt, we didn't have helmets. We had a very different uh, way of life. Uh, and uh, I imagine that in 10 or 20 years, everybody's going to be vegetarian. Uh, we're changing the, the, the way we, we live our lives. And uh, it's going to affect gambling also. 
Uh, and what I'm saying here is that I, I think that we're not going to see any more big gamblers, big spenders, but gambling is going to change towards something where everybody's going to gamble together, something that's much more social, much more acceptable. Uh, uh, it's, it's acceptable today to be a poker player. It's, you don't advertise the fact that, uh, the fact that uh, you're a casino player. And I think that's going to change. And I think that's where uh, slowly regulation is driving us. And uh, I had a discussion about that with uh, uh, other people, other operators, and they say, no, look at us. We, 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 we're doing a good work with the, with the players. We, we don't rip them off. We have people coming and having fun and enjoying what they, what they do. I say, yes. But if you take your ancestor in this uh, industry, they were not doing that. And we are doing that because regulation is pushing us toward there. Uh, we can take it as something that we, we don't like, or we can just accept that uh, it's, a, it's a kind of uh, I know, sign of times and that yeah. we have all to go there. It's interesting. I mean, interesting points about the evolution of the industry. Gaming itself is obviously evolving, technology-wise, industry-wise. Uh, <laughs> I don't think anyone in the room would have missed the uh, news coming out from the Daily Mail, the BBC, uh, The Guardian, talking about uh, the treatment of women at these conferences. Um, I think over of course. Um, but I guess what we found ourselves in is a position where, particularly in the affiliate space, operators have relied 20 years. Significant volumes of their traffic and revenue come through the affiliate channel. Um, and for me, the, the one area that I, I see and I have received I guess misgivings about what we're trying to do with the IGA is create a path, a roadmap to help control the look and feel of our industry to the future. Affiliates, to my mind, uh, you can disagree with this, um, have been very, very good at burying their heads in the sand when it comes to issues. They rely on operators to inform them of bits and pieces. Um, that right now, obviously with, with laws changing, um, the viewpoint of particularly the media towards gambling uh, and even to the affiliate industry now um, means that we really do need to get ahead of the game here. Um, so in terms of getting on the front foot, uh, what else other than obviously forming a trade body that uh, could act perhaps as an industry mouthpiece to obviously assist affiliates, demonstrate that actually 99% of affiliates do comply, as a guess, um, and are just taking various steps to, to act and behave responsibly. Is there anything else you feel that uh, we could can do as individual affiliates or as a collective to get on the front foot when it comes to media, when it comes to political pressure, if you will? Is there anything we could do? Helen, any examples of anything that the Performance Marketing Council has done to support other industries? Yeah, so I, I think what um, you're talking about at the moment reminds me of where we were 10 years ago. So there was um, a guy that worked for ASOS, a scene on screen, and I think maybe 10, 11 years ago, he referred to the affiliate industry as grubby. He said affiliates are all grubby, it's a horrible place to be, no brand should ever work with them. This is like one of the biggest brands in the UK. I think that's when we really realized we needed to clean up our act. There were a lot of grubby things going on in the affiliate industry. There was a lot of bad practice, there was a lot of fraud. Uh, there was a lot of people kind of finding loopholes. Um, so that's why we formed the kind of council and a group of people to do this, to really clean up the act. And I think in 10 years, we've done a really good job of that because we got on the front foot. If we hadn't done that, I don't think we would have the likes of BT and Vodafone and Sky and Thomas Cook working in the affiliate industry as they do today. The affiliate channel is one of their biggest channels of their digital marketing. And I think if we hadn't done that 10 years ago, we wouldn't be in that position. So I, I do think getting people together and collaborating and trying to be proactive and showing the industry that you're trying to do a good job is a good place to be. Interesting. It's one of the things I've noticed talking to affiliates here at the show, which quite surprised me a little bit, was a month or so ago when I started kind of talking to operators about the compliance side, affiliates weren't engaging because they were getting mixed signals, they didn't really want to engage. <clears throat> and at the show here, I've spoken to several affiliates over the evenings and stuff, that bigger affiliates and what have you, and they are now really focused on it. It's clearly the message is getting across. And even affiliates that I didn't think would want to have been talking to me and saying, you know, the information we're getting from the scans, can we have it because we want to tidy up, etc., etc. There's, there's definitely a change happening just in the past two or three weeks in terms of how people are viewing it. And I think it's great. I think it's absolutely spot on for the industry. It's what it needs. 
yeah. And it's, it's not easy by any means. Like we've had a lot of challenges and there's still a lot of bad practices in, in our industry as well. And there's still a lot of disagreement about what's the way to go forward. But I guess we've got to the point where as long as we get the biggest players on board and the most voices, then it works. And at least we can do something and push it forward. Hmm. Just a question. Do, do you think it is compatible with a revenue share uh, uh, business model? Because we, we were talking about uh, the, the, the operator being an advertiser. When you think about op uh, th that model, okay, we are an advertiser and we pay uh, a, a media uh, to uh, display our advertisements. But that's not what affiliation is. Uh, it's completely different. It's, uh, it's a money, testosterone driven uh, industry. Uh, uh, the guys are really trying to, to, to get the players. Uh, it, 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 look, 50% revenue share, that's what, you, that's what you see right here. And, and, and this uh, uh, will obviously uh, push towards some kind of, uh, of, of behavior in, in business. That's, uh, uh, let's say, are hard to control in terms of compliance. So it's an interesting point about revenue share. And I guess I harp back to the point about the evolution industry and where it's come from. Um, obviously, way back when, um, it's called the Wild West, uh, late 90s, early noughties, as we were embarking on the affiliate industry and gaming. Um, the, put this the right way. Uh, the, who held the power in that relationship between operator and affiliate has evolved. And actually, I think right at the moment in time, it's, it's, it's markedly shifted in the last six months. Uh, post UIGEA, uh, I know as I've worked for a UK operator trying to get dot com traffic for the English UK market, uh, it's very difficult to compete pre UIGEA with American brands who obviously have a wi much wider audience, even at that time had far less regulation. Um, it's obviously far wider now. Um, and as soon as UIGEA happened, I had an opportunity, as did every other UK, European operator, to go and get that traffic. Uh, and that meant throwing out 50% revenue share deals. And that shot, back in the day, 100% revenue share deals. Nuts. Just to get that traffic, get that coin in. Uh, and obviously, as regulation has evolved, operator margins have shrunk. Uh, things like sizable revenue share deals and things like no negative carryover, all things that really hinder operator margins. Um, for a long period of time, affiliates have, I'd say, abused that, uh, but kind of just expected it, uh, because obviously, as you know, more and more operators have appeared, arguably fewer affiliates have appeared, um, and it's been a land grab. That has now markedly changed, uh, and I've spoken to a few uh, UK CEOs of, of gambling businesses, and their directives to their affiliate managers, which for 20 years has been, go find me players, good rate. Um, and get us ROI. That was the key. Now the directive is, and, I, and having judged the affiliate awards, I saw this a number of the affiliate managers' submissions. We haven't grown our business, we shrunk it. The directive is, don't lose us our license and don't get us a big fine. Which, which uh, leads us uh, certainly to uh, a way that I think that the, the price of the player is going to drop uh, on the UK markets. Because uh, Operators are going to be more and more reluctant to, to, to take uh, a, a, any kind of traffic. And the second thing that I see coming, and correct me if I'm wrong, where you have operators that are sub-licensing their license uh, to white labels. Uh, uh, so you see operators that can't control their own affiliates, and you will see operators that have uh, 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 white labels that have affiliates. And I have the feeling that at some point these guys are going to say, "Okay, stop. We we we're not giving you uh, our platform or white label for for UK. You can have it for .com with Malta or whatever, but we won't give it uh, to you to, uh, for UK." I uh, I have a UKGC license. I would never sublicense it to to anyone. I, I don't see how these guys can do it and, and and will be able to continue doing that. Which means that we're going to have much less uh, casinos on the UK market and uh, much, but much less buyers uh, of, of traffic. Sure, you'd just end up with more licenses, wouldn't you? Wouldn't the, the sub-licensees just go and get their own license? 
Yes, but they, they, there's a they, there's a entry fee that they cannot spend. That's why they are white labels. They cannot go there. They, and especially now with the uh, level of compliance, uh, it's completely out of reach for them. So there's a lot of to, to grab a point from that. Uh, there's a lot of gray areas that exist in this business. Too far too many, uh, and, and that does need to evolve. Obviously, internationally, even gambling is is gray in a lot of markets that affiliates operate in, and a lot of markets these exhibitors are, are, are pushing for traffic for. Um, those gray areas I, I can't see being removed, obviously pre-May GDPR. Um, there's clear directive there. Um, the point I'd like to make about those gray areas is, is the opportunism of some perhaps smaller operators, uh, and even some of the bigger ones, to curtail affiliate operations, to stop paying affiliates revenue share. Uh, is arguably, uh, can be perceived, uh, and certainly will be for some more disingenuous operators, uh, as exactly that, disingenuous. That for commercial reasons, they're scaling back their affiliate operations not to comply. Does anyone agree with that point? Is it something perhaps Helen that, uh, perhaps saw uh, and was picked up upon by those affiliates that were affected uh, when the, the finance industry scaled things back? Yeah. Uh, it's a difficult one because I guess it's different for every operator but so one of the things that we've done in a performance council and it's been very challenging actually is to have so we have lots of best practice as well as some of the regulatory things um, but an advertiser charter so an ethical advertiser charter because sometimes advertisers do things which really screw affiliates over as you're kind of saying and it's very frustrating so they decline sales, they decide to stop paying when they've got a big promotion, they stop paying two days before Christmas or whatever. Like They do things like that which really screw affiliates over and is really bad for the industry. Um, so we've tried to do more things around as an advertiser, this is best practice, this is how you should treat affiliates. But at the end of the day, if they want to pull their affiliate program, they pull their affiliate program. If they want to cut their commissions in half, they cut their commissions in half. I don't agree with it, and it's something we're still trying to challenge, but they're always going to have that power, unfortunately. Now, for, from what I've seen, I, I clearly, that there's two rules. There's the rule life sign, revenue share, and um, that should be applied. And you have affiliates that have, let's say, 10, 20,000 revenue with a with a certain operator, and on the other side is the rule of breach of contract. I almost lost my license because of you, you know what, I'm going to cut this contract. Yeah, but what about the, the play I've sent you all, all over, all over the years? I, I start as an affiliate myself, and I still have some affiliate business. I really find it outrageous. And I've seen a lot of operators lately closing uh, all the all affiliate program or shutting down affiliates and stop paying them revenues that per contract were lifetime. Uh, that's not acceptable. The one, one thing I'd add to that is I've spoken to a lot of operators about compliance over the past couple of months, and almost without exception, they've all, even the big ones that have done the closing down, have all said we intend to scale back up again. So. We're just trying to get rid of the risk now of having losing our license. We're taking it down right to the bare bones, and then we're going to build it up slowly based on trust, and only with the affiliates we know we can trust. <clears throat> so I, I don't think it's most programs. In fact, one operator said to me, he said, if we don't take those affiliates, if we, if we don't go back into the affiliate market properly, we know our competitors are. So we have to. Interesting. Um so I, I sat on a similar panel to this at ICE early in the week, um, and Mark Etches from uh, Be Gamble Aware came up with a very, very good point. So Be Gamble Aware is the UK's uh, leading player protection charity. Um, and in fact, it was him with Clive Hawkswood for the RGA. Both of them made this point um, about what is an affiliate, definition of an affiliate. Uh, the CMA, uh, I sat in a briefing with them earlier in the week, reference third-party marketers. That is something that is used with the Advertising Standards Agency as well. Uh, and that is, for me, it, it broadens the question out here. Uh, and perhaps what we do need to do, perhaps we could do it through the IGAA. And we obviously need um, some B2B coverage on this as well. But defining what an affiliate is, this third-party marketer logic, to me, 
also brings into the loop football clubs. Uh, and some of those um, perhaps wouldn't even consider, wouldn't even be looking at uh, the need to comply. They obviously a lot of them carry shirts, sponsorships. Those shirts can be worn by children, but bought by children, obviously uh, targeting children. Beyond football clubs, third-party marketers to me include Google, Facebook, uh, media, The Guardian, even, who run uh, performance targeting, performance marketing targeted ads, uh, even when they're writing uh, to disaffiliates. Um, that I don't think. I think. Would you agree that that's something that does need to be defined when we look at what compliance is and what operators are doing with those third parties? Because obviously, affiliate marketing. Traditionally, obviously, it's websites, email, the, the, the darker side of digital marketing um, in, in some people's eyes. Should it include bigger super companies that do earn on, on effectively a performance model, whether that be through PPC, whether that be through shirt sponsorships? It's all the same logic. The, um, the guy from the UKGC was, you know, also said while we were talking that they realised that it's impossible for everyone to be 100% compliant, whether it be an affiliate, whether it be an operator. They said, we know it's impossible. And he, he gave the impression to me anyway that <clears throat> this will be a slow process and it'll probably, a lot of it will be driven by issues. So, you know, if you end up with Man City selling a, I don't know, Stoke, selling a Bet365 shirt to a kid who goes online and manages to gamble, that might suddenly become an issue. But I think, um, I think at the moment my, my gut feel is that there's a drive and they're trying to clean up the bonus thing, trying to make everything transparent, make sure that everyone knows what they're getting. And um, they'll probably leave it at that for the time being. And then gradually, bit by bit, we'll see something else come along over the years. But I, yeah, you could argue that you're right, but I think it'll be a very slow process. I think uh, it, oh. About what you said, uh, Tom, I've always asked myself this question a long time ago when I was a, a search engine optimizer. We used to buy traffic per, per click and then it came per lead, and then it came per, 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 per user for, let's say, deposits, and then we got the revenue share, and then we got the hybrids, et cetera, et cetera. And where do, 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 when do you say it's an affiliate or it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a marketer, it's an advertiser or whatever? And it's, it's a very interesting question because for me, the business model uh, uh, will define uh, the relationship. Uh, and we define the role of the affiliate. And when we talk about revenue share, uh, there, 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 is, there, there is clearly a, a partnership, uh, and, and th th this defines an affiliate. But uh, we have tools today that are able very precisely to give us the price of a click. And it's, the, the, the limit is very blurry. I don't know what you think about, 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 uh, about that. How, how would you define an affiliate? Yeah. That, that's another thing that came from the UKGC was they define any problem as where there's a finan financial transaction between the problem, the, the, the bad advert, whatever it happens to be, and the operator. If there's no financial transaction between them, then he inferred that that wasn't an issue. Yeah. And that that's mainly, that was brought up because I talked about competitors. You know, what happens if you wanted to bring a brand down? And you wanted to run a bad campaign, and you know you set up an affiliate account, and said, "Well, then obviously, there's, we have to have some sort of definitions in there." Yeah. So the UKGC has defined that. No, no. When they when they investigate an issue of non-compliance, that's the thing they're looking for that kind of defines whether there's an issue to actually investigate. Is there a financial transaction between, say, Alex and the person who ever put that advert up? Is Alex paying that guy for? the traffic. If there is, there's something so, to investigate. So, so that does include Facebook, Google. Yeah. It does include football clubs. I think that's a really important step. We always need to step back here, don't we, really? Um, to define, you know, define affiliate. Is this something that you know, you, you've done on your site, Helen? No, we've been trying to define affiliate marketing for about 25 years <laughs> and we still haven't done it. But I think it goes back to what you said. For me, it's a model. It's a business model. Um, so I don't think affiliate is a channel. It's a model. It, you connect advertisers to affiliates and you pay a cost per sale or a revenue share in the middle. That's, for me, how it's defined. But therefore, that means literally anybody can be affiliate. 
Um, and that's a challenge that I think we have with regulators to say what is an affiliate relationship and what's not. And they don't really understand that. But then we've struggled to define it. So if we can't define it, it's hard for them. Um, but, you know, BuzzFeed is an affiliate. The Guardian is an affiliate. Money Supermarket's an affiliate. The guy with his own blog is an affiliate. It can be anybody. And that's always going to be our challenge. Yeah. Amazon, Amazon yeah. the biggest company in the world, yeah. is an affiliate. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, that's a, that's a much bigger macro environment yeah. question there. Uh, but I think it's important we, we address it. Uh, it probably is important it's written down on paper so that the powers that be can see that. Uh, because you're right, uh, unless we have a, a united voice to, that clearly defines what we do as an industry and who that entails, um, it's very difficult to move things forward. So obviously we, uh, we're at a point in time where you know, it's, a, it's a tipping point, a huge tipping point, I think. Um, the buzzword is compliance. The requirements for operators is more comply than senders traffic in the UK. Um, that's going to your point about Denmark, have further reach internationally. In terms of sort of next steps individual affiliates can take or come together, what should they, other than I was using Rightlander, what should they be doing right now uh, to, to get their ducks aligned to make sure they comply? The best they can do at the moment, I think, is to try and interpret what the operators are telling them, but every operator is telling them something different. And, uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the Paddy Power one that went out the other day, for example, talked about um, you must make sure that any content on any page where you're representing our brand and sending us traffic clearly reflects the advert that you're using on that page. You know, for a lot of affiliates, that's a relatively straightforward thing. For a lot of affiliates, that's an almost impossible thing. So, well, you just, you know, you just what are they going to do? They're going to probably divert their Paddy Power links to someone else for the time being just to get around the problem. It's, there's no answer to that question. It's just getting affiliates to engage, understanding, doing, going through the process, the operators managing it. If they want to shut that affiliate off until they've sorted it out, that's down to the operator. It's a process of learning and everyone's going to treat it differently. So I think if I was still an affiliate and I had my network going, I'd probably stop working, stop sending traffic to certain brands. I'd have gone into my database and done exactly what I just said for certain brands because I knew I couldn't go back that far. And with other brands, I'd be, be able to change it quickly. And then gradually I'd work towards maybe taking traffic back to the other brands. That's probably how I'd do it. We, we really need to have affiliates involved because at the end of the day, what's going to happen is that affiliates that are not compliant uh, are going to be thrown away from uh, 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 operators. The operators that they wouldn't work, want to work with them. So uh, it's a Is that not too subjective still, though? There's a subjectiveness to this that I think is, it causes affiliates confusion. It's not necessarily just the variation in direction and guidelines from operators, but it's the, there's a subjectivity to it, right? I think the Gambling Commission's position doesn't help that. You know, the, the, the requirement to go above and beyond what the LCCP principles outline. It's not clear enough, and operators obviously don't, you know, therefore, have mixed messages. Um, but I know, Ian, obviously, your product does create objectivity, but it doesn't go the whole hog. How do we get past that subjective uh, definition of compliance? It should be black and white, right? I, I don't think it can be black and white at the moment. I, th I think it just, that's a process that comes over time. It's like when we had the cookie thing a few years ago, suddenly everyone had to put the cookie thing on their website. And that's all you got was, you know, you have to make sure that if you're saving any data about the, the person that visits your website, no one quite knew how to interpret that at first. So you had a million different things that you know, pop ups and pop unders and you can't visit this site, you can't see the content. And then it all settled down. People started to understand what it meant. And now you just get the, the banner pop up on some sites and that's it. And I think compliance will go a similar sort of route. I think we'll learn over the next few months exactly what's being achieved, how people are achieving it best, and we'll start to reach a level of standardization. But I think it's a process you have to go through. So that cookie consent point's a really good one, right? I've never heard of any operator who shut an affiliate down because they didn't put the cookie consent thing there. Why, why now? Why, why are we now in a place where... But they didn't find them, really, did they? They didn't turn around and slap hefty fines and threaten no. to take their license away. I mean, yeah, that's yeah. the difference. That's true. Because it burns more now. <laughs> <laughs> it really does. But it, uh, just to try to answer your question, we, we don't know clearly the rules. I don't think anyone here knows clearly the rules, and there's new rules coming up every day. Uh, the important thing is that you get into the process. 
the important thing is that you understand that you have to do something, that you have to start reading about it. Like, you know what, you, you read uh, about SEO as an affiliate, you go to conference, you want to hear about link building. Now, you know what, you have to integrate compliance. And uh, uh, if you don't do it, you're going to die. And even if you have huge, uh, lots of traffic, you're going to die. Uh, so you need now to integrate compliance as an affiliate. Uh, operators are, are going to go along with you, but you need to do something there. On, on our side, what we do with co start now communicating with affiliates about that, uh, uh, we use a right lander tool. Uh, uh, and what, what we do is show them that there is something to be done. On, we do it on our side, but you guys also have to do it on your side. And we're going to check, but at the end of the day, it's, it's not bulletproof. It's, it, it's your responsibility. Do you, do you think that operators, there's a chance for operators to come together, uh, you know, flipping what we're doing with the IGA, with affiliates coming together? Is there a chance that operators can get together and provide unilateral guidelines for affiliates? Is there, have you had any conversations with, with other operators? No, to no. be honest. We, we, I think you should, personally. Yeah, no, yeah, no. It's, 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 I have. You have, but you're, have. Not, you're not an operator. So I know I, you have. I I've had, I, no, I've, I've, we've, each, the operators I've been talking to that are using Rightlander have been giving me the stuff they want us to scan for to identify violations. And we've probably had, over the past two or three weeks, 20, 30 different things come in from different operators. And no two of them have been the same. They've, every single one has been different. And I've spoken to them about a standardization process and whether there is one. And they're not, at the moment, everyone's reluctant to talk about that because they have a very clear idea about, it's not actually coming from the affiliate programs, it seems to be coming down from above. Yeah. And I think everyone is finding their feet. They're, they're, it might come, someone will hit on something, something will happen, you know, some press will come out, we were gonna find them, we didn't because they had this, and suddenly everyone will go, right, we're gonna do that. And that's what's gonna happen, I think. The operators won't get together, I don't think, and, and do that. Well, I think there actually have been some discussions in, in the UK, a couple of UK bodies, Senate Group and the RGA, I think. So the operators within those are certainly discussing what they could collectively do when it comes to guidelines and best practice principles. Um, right, I think we're nearly out of time. I wonder if we have any questions from the floor. I know they've come through the app. So I get it that the regulations are very subjective and affiliates don't know, you know, whether it's what's a significant term or condition or does the content appeal to minors, but in my opinion, affiliates, some affiliates have still done absolutely nothing to become compliant. You know, if you Google casino sites or free spins, look at the top 10 sites that rank organically. No terms and conditions reference. Content that appeals to minor, all over the place. Do these affiliates deserve to have their accounts put down if they've done nothing? Uh, do you want to answer that one? Uh, well, possibly. You know, for, for why are they doing nothing? I mean, if you look at well, what's happened, there's been so many closures. How are people still doing nothing? Well, it's a fair point. Um, burying your head in the sand is, is, is one way of looking at it. Well, Secondly, there's still operators that are not pushing their, their affiliates to do it. So? Well, it's great. It causes confusion. And there's a commercial aspect to it. You know, really, nobody knows what's going to happen. Of course, more affiliate programs could, could shut down. They could switch affiliate accounts off. There's a risk. There's a risk. Even if you did those things, you could have your affiliate account shut down. But right. doing nothing. Well, I agree. And they should be doing something. Of course they should. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying here saying they shouldn't. Uh, uh, every affiliate should be doing that. Just from our point of view, so we, um, I say we, the collaboration of the IAB, we closed down two really big affiliates across the whole industry because they weren't being compliant because it just became such a point that it would negatively affect everyone. And if we didn't close them down, then all the other affiliates would do the same as well. They, it would kind of set a precedent. Uh, that was big though. That cost a lot of people a lot of money, but it worked and they sorted themselves out. Yeah, I mean, that, you're right. That's, it, it just takes one scenario like that to happen. And people do realize and then get their butts in gear. Uh, but they would have realized just, just right to, now. To answer the point and, and to plug the IGA a little bit, of course, when members come on board, the plan is for them to be uh, obviously signing up to best practice in compliance and of course they all have to do those things otherwise they lose their membership lose the, the credibility hopefully that that will bring I, I think this is exactly why Leo Vegas and Bet365 have done what they've done 
because they can't afford to take that risk. So they're going right down to nothing, pretty much nothing, and they're going to build up slowly. So those affiliates won't be able to work with those brands at that time, and that will gradually filter across. So those affiliates will run out of options at some point anyway, in my opinion. Do you think, without, without naming these companies, but do you think that's, that's uh, real or it's just PR? I, I was asking myself, did they really do that? Did they really close all the affiliates and just uh, uh, left five of them? Or is it just PR? I think it's real. From the, I've, got, I've spoken to both of them at length and I'm convinced it's real. Okay. Uh, but it's a, it's, a good, it's a valid point. I think uh, maybe just to we have probably time for one more question, I'm not sure. Uh, but it's a perception thing, right? They're, even if they're not doing what they're sending, of Sky, but have not really closed their affiliate program now, it doesn't matter. The perception to the wider world, to the media, to, to politicians, right. is that they are taking those steps. And that's why you know, we do need to do this as affiliates, as operators in industry. Yeah, the, the, the only thing here is that, that my, my first uh, feeling was, wow, okay, something is, is being done. And then you speak with affiliates, and that's exactly what happened during this, uh, this show. And I've heard, like, Alex, it's all bullshit. Yeah. And when you, when you hear that, then what's happening after that, it's business as usual. Agreed. And that's very dangerous. Yeah, but that's it. It's the, it's the stepping back, ticking a box, and doing business as usual. Uh, I have one more question over there. Yeah, so with esports being a growing market, it changes the way that we work with affiliates and we work a lot with streamers and these are live streams and how do you think we're gonna be able to monitor that when something happens live if someone breaks any kind of marketing guidelines etc uh, so it's the question about esports and live streaming yes yeah, so you have affiliates who yeah. obviously have an affiliate deal with an operator and market that during live streams. So when it's all happening live, there's nothing written, it's nothing saved. Uh, that's a tricky, tricky question. Anyone I'm have an Distracted answer? by uh, Martin Beacon's uh, <laughs> Muppet. <laughs> um, you, 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 you can go now. <laughs> uh, does anyone have an answer to that? Uh, I don't know whether there is an answer. It's always going to be uh, after the event, isn't it? You're only going to find out that's a problem when someone complains about it. Um, I, I don't know if there's any other way around it. I guess when you find that out, you can maybe take action, but that's the only way it's always going to be reactionary. Is, is there any technology out there that can monitor things like that and record and look for certain words within? Because, I mean, that would be a logical step if that sort of technology is out there, but I'm not even sure it exists. But if it did operators could potentially apply that to because when you can identify you can generally identify where these uh, twitchers and the youtubers are because they have a url so there must be i would have thought some sort of technology out there that could do some sort of monitoring on sound that would be my guess and that's the way I, that's the way i'd be looking at it but i don't think there's any other way i think i think for me the fact you've asked the question the fact we can't give you an answer to that question that concisely the purpose of what i'm going to do with the igaa is to when these things come about, these questions get raised, they then get discussed, and we have a narrative to relate to the wider world. We are looking at this, and we're looking to build a solution. We're doing X, Y, and Z. We're taking these measures to protect the interests of vulnerable customers, making sure where we can, do what we can, to effectively comply with the law and be responsible. Um, so it's a case of learning, because obviously new technology is going to come out, new verticals are going to come out, uh, and that needs to be guided we need, that, we need to guide that as an industry at the minute, and that, that has never happened in this industry at all. So to answer the point, if there's no answer to it, let's create an answer together. Uh, I think we're probably out of time, guys. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to come up and ask us afterwards. Uh, but I'd like to thank my fellow panelists, uh, Helen, Alex, and Ian, and thank you for the, all listening so intently. Thanks.